Today's daf we're going to be learning is Kiddushin Daf Nun Dalet. This is the daf for Hoshana Rabba. Today's daf is sponsored by Gita Neufeld in loving memory of her mother-in-law, Idol Bat Natan Besara, Alice Neufeld. Ma led by example with her yekish, scrupulous observance of mitzvot, her appreciation of beauty in all its manifestations, and her prioritization of learning and academic achievement. She never made me feel like I was her daughter-in-law. I was her daughter. We had the schut to have her live with us at the end of her long life, and the impact of that time continues to resound within us and our children and grandchildren. Yehi zechra baruch. Okay, we're going to get started with a quick review of yesterday, what we saw at the previous daf. We saw this machloket, both about Maasir Shani, which we'll come back to later, and hektish. If somebody betrothes a woman with hektish money, which is not allowed to use to betroth a woman, is she betrothed or not? So Rabbi Meir had said, and right now we're focusing exclusively on Rabbi Meir, that b'mezid kiddush, if he did it intentionally, it's actually kiddushin because when you misuse consecrated property intentionally, you basically turn it into chulin. You basically say, I want this to be not sacred, and therefore it's not sacred, and therefore she's betrothed. But if you do it b'shogeg, Rabbi Meir says, and this is what we're going to struggle to really understand, Rabbi Meir says b'shogeg kiddush, um, sorry, b'shogeg lo kiddush. She is not betrothed if you did it accidentally. What we saw on Daf Nun Gimel is that Rabbi Yochanan explains this is because neither one, or maybe only one of them, anyway, that's all machluk that we got into yesterday. The main point is it's what we call a mekach ta'ud. They didn't want this to happen. Nobody would, want, would have wanted to use a sanctified money to betroth the woman, and therefore it's what we call a mekach ta'ud. It's a mistake, in which case, Nothing ever happened. And that's what they end up asking on yesterday's daf. Do you really mean to say that if somebody spends money, sanctified money, on something, that that money, is this what Rabbi Meir is saying? That money is actually never, it doesn't, what normally happens in Me'ila is I misuse consecrated property and it turns to Chulin. But it sounds like what Rabbi Yochanan is explaining here is that according to Rabbi Meir, this money doesn't become unsanctified this because nothing really ever happened here okay the money was never given the mekach was a mistake it was as if no money transferred because nothing actually happened okay that's what we explained yesterday okay ma'ot ma'oshi yitzu l'chulin that was the question asked of Chista and he says right if isha en mekadeshet the ma'ot he'ach yitzu l'chulin it must be they did it become chulin otherwise Rabbi Mary would have allowed this okay Again, this is very different the way we understand Me'ila because we end up, and we'll see later from our suga, we end up understanding Me'ila according to Rabbi Yehuda, who doesn't agree with this. Because Me'ila in general is Bishkaga. That's clear from the Torah. And therefore, even if it was accidental, it should work. Okay? It should turn to non-sacred. Okay? But it's clear that, which is why Rabbi Yehuda says, if it's Bishkaga, then it actually turns into unsanctified money, which means that she actually is betrothed. But we're trying to understand Rabbi Meir. So we're now going to have a second understanding of Rabbi Meir because this sounds really crazy that Rabbi Meir would say, if, if the Torah talks about shkaga, what is shkaga if not this? So, right, this is shkaga. You use money by accident, thinking you went to the store, bought something with sanctified money, or you betrothed a woman with sanctified money, thinking it wasn't sanctified. That's classic me'ila. So how could you say it didn't turn to chulin? Now, again, Rabbi, the logic until now in Rabbi Yochanan is because nothing really happened. Me'ila would be if I actually ate something. Okay, and we'll get back to this later. And it's no longer here. And then I could say, well, that's me'ila. But if nothing ever happened and the sale reverts back, I keep my money, you keep your item, nothing ever happened, or he's not betrothed to her, then how could you say, right? That's the understanding. Rabbi Meir says that actually the money stays sanctified. But I'm a rough. Rav says, this is preposterous. And he basically starts off at the top of Radaf and says, I've looked all over everything Rabbi Meir said. I've tried all the possibilities. This distinction that if he does it on purpose, it'll turn into chulin. But if he does it, it won't turn into chulin. That doesn't make any sense. And really what he's focusing on is, Bishogeg, of course it's mitchalel. Because that's, korba me'ila is on shkaga. So what if it was eaten? So what if it wasn't eaten? If the money's still there, if the money reverts back? But, but that's what me'ila is. It's misuse of consecrated property. And obviously then, once you misuse it, you consider it 
Chul, and even though it wasn't intentional, because again, Me'ila in general isn't, intention, isn't intentional. Me'ila, according to the Torah, is when you do it accidentally. So that's just the way it works with Me'ila. So it can't possibly be that's what Rabbi Meir said. So now we're stuck, because if Rabbi Meir really thinks it turns to Chulin, then why does he think that you can't betroth a woman with this? In order to explain that, Rav has to say the Mishnah isn't a very unique case. Our Mishnah is talking about big day kuna, the, the Kohen's clothing that are not worn out, that are in good, pristine shape, you know, that are still being used, that means. Because what's different about these? Well, specifically these, there's no law of me'ila. Okay, there's me'ila. Well, there is laws of me'ila, sort of, but we'll see. The very interesting line, which appears a few times in, in the Gemara. The Torah was not given to angels. What does that have to do with anything? Well, we're human beings. That means that when we are Kohanim working in the temple and we wear special kahuna clothes for the Avoda, now what happens? We finish our Avoda. Can we go put a snap of a finger and, and I don't benefit from those clothes anymore and you know, my new clothes are on my regular clothes. No, it takes a minute, however long it does, for me to go change those clothes. Can't happen in an instant. I'm not an angel. I can't do magic. So what happens? Well, the regular coin clothing is actually given for people to benefit from in some sort of way, which is the coin can get to a changing room, change his clothes, and in, enjoy benefit from the clothing. It's covering his body that whole time. He's getting benefit from them in that small amount of time. This is because the Torah wasn't given to angels. We, we don't have a way to do it otherwise. So because of that, what do we end up saying? We end up saying that our Mishnah, okay, now you have to make a jump. Since these clothes had some way that one could benefit from them, if, and therefore, there's no loss of Me'ila, or at least, right, in other words, now we have to make that turnover. It's not that there's no loss of Me'ila, but if somebody accidentally used those clothes to betroth the woman, since there's a, and, and it was just by accident, and it's bemazed, okay, well, he intentionally turned them into something whole, something not sacred. But if it happened by accident, since we have this area where there is some, those, those quick moments after the client finishes working that one can benefit, likewise here we're going to say theoretically one can benefit, meaning we won't obligate you in Me'ila. If we don't obligate you in Me'ila, then there's no chilul, it never becomes unsacred. If it never becomes unsacred, you can't control the woman. That's what Rabbi Meir says. It's a little bit complicated. I want to focus for one quick minute because I, I can't avoid doing this. It's so interesting. This concept of we are not like angels. Now, normally it's understood to mean, right, we wish we could be like angels, but we can't, right? And that's just the way it is. But Professor Christina Hayes, who is a professor that analyzes a lot of Talmudic sugiot, an excellent um, Talmudic professor, uh, professor of Talmud, she talked about, she talks that she has a, an excellent shiur you can find online um, about this line, Lo Torah and she basically flips it on its head and said, this is actually an ideal. This is, we aspire to say that we are not like angels. And that she, she quotes this, she has a line that says, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. If we strive for perfection, we won't actually be able to do mitzvot. Right? If, if you couldn't, and if you had to be like an angel, then you wouldn't be able to use these clothes at all. And then the coin would never be able to have clothes that he could wear for his work and then not benefit from them. Because we're humans and we have no choice but to sometimes benefit from something that maybe we're not supposed to because there's no other way to do it. It would prevent us from being able to keep the Torah. And that's something unique and, and something that we aspire to as humans, that we are humans. And that allows us to keep mitzvot in, in, a, in a better way. And she quotes it using the times, you can see where this appears in the, in the Gemara, this phrase, from there, she uh, creates her theory. Anyway, that's an aside. Now we're going to get back to our topic. So we now explained, according to Rav, that this is a unique situation. Okay, just in this, but normally, shogeg, me'ila, it's not because of a mekach ta'ut. It's not because there was a mistake here and, the, and no one ever would have really wanted this to happen. No, me'ila kicks in. The, the sacred item becomes whole. And actually, you can betroth it with it. Only if, right, like if it was sacred ma'ot, money, if it was sanctified, it would work, okay, to betroth the woman. So now we're going to bring a few sources to try to raise contradiction against Rav. Three sources that we're going to all, we're going to have answers to all of them. Tashma, maybe more convincing or less convincing, but we will have answers. Kotsnot kuhunah If you have 
clothing of a coin that already is worn out. So Rabbi Meir says there is me'ila by clothing of a coin that's worn out, and we assume if the worn out clothing is sanctified to the extent that there's me'ila, then obviously the non-worn out clothing would be all the more so sanctified, and there would be a law of me'ila, and that goes against what we said here. My lava filu lo balu, right? So it sounds like it's saying if they were worn away, and, and all the more so if they weren't worn away, because you would think those have higher level of sanctity to them. But the Gemara says, no, no, no. Lo, balu dafka. No, no, no. It's specifically when they're worn out, then you no longer have this ability to use them in any way, to benefit from them. And then it would actually go back to having me'ila. These don't have me'ila because they're, they can be used. Those are the better ones, can be used, and therefore there is no me'ila. The ones that are worn out, there is a lot of me'ila. Tashma, second source. Now we're talking about coins in the temple. Everyone would bring the machatzira shekel to the temple, the half shekel. That money would go into a, a, a box, three boxes, and then they would, three times a year, they would take money out and buy sacrifices with it. Now, whatever money was left was called shayarei alishka, and they were called the old ones. If we didn't need all that money for the sacrifices, for buying the animals, then they were called, that was the extra leftover. That's called the atik in the old ones. Or if I forgot to bring one year, then I bring the next year, but my last year's doesn't go into the main then it goes into what's called the Shire Alishka, the extras. So now there's a law of Me'ila for the new shekels that are going to be used to buy the sacrifices, but there isn't a law of Me'ila for the old ones. I have Devere Rabbi Yehuda, but it's in parentheses here, so that means we really shouldn't use it. Most of the people think that that shouldn't be here, so let's just say this is Tanakama. Now Rabbi Meir, Omeil, this is where it's going to be important to us because it's going to contradict what the way Rav understands Rabbi Meir. Mo'alim af ba'atikim, even old shekels, there's a lot of me'ila by them. Shaya Rabbi Meir Omeo, mo'alim b'shayarei ha'lishka. Because Rabbi Meir was known to say there is me'ila by the shayarei ha'lishka, and the old coins go to the shayarei ha'lishka. That's the extra money. We're going to see in a minute what this has to do with. Well, amai, and what do we do with the shayarei ha'lishka? Amai, nemahu il v'nitnu lehenot, l'fi shalom nitna Torah l'malachei ha'sharet. Okay, well, wait a minute. Wasn't the Shaharei Alishka given to people that they could benefit from it because the Torah wasn't given to angels, the same claim? Now, why? We should have learned this in the beginning, but the walls of the city and its towers, the city of Jerusalem, okay, let's start from the end now. The walls of the city and the towers were built from this Shaharei Alishka money. Now, if you walk by a building and the building is blocking the sun, you have no choice but to benefit from it. You're not an angel that could somehow doesn't need shade at all. You need shade. You're going to benefit from that 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 wall. Okay, wall. Maybe you'll lean against it by act, you know at some point. That was given to people to benefit from the walls. So they're not like sanctified items that that there's no benefit, right? That people don't benefit. There is. You might say the walls of Jerusalem are sanctified, but there is room for people to use them. Now, Rabbi Mayer says because there's room for people to use them, there's no law of meila. That doesn't fit here. He says there is a law of me'ila by the walls, right? By the money, which is used to buy the walls. And people benefit from the walls, just like the Kani benefit from their clothing. So how do we explain this? Very simply, It's a mistake. And it should say Rabbi Yehuda and not Rabbi Meir. And that's how we resolve it. We're going to try to do the same thing with the next source, but we're going to have a little more trouble with that. But we will figure it out in the end and attribute it to Rabbi Yehuda. Tashma de Tanya. So let's look at here. It says in a bright Amar Rabbi Yishmael bar Rabbi Yitzchak, Avnei Yerushalayim shenashru mo'alim bahem, divrei Rabbi Meir. The stones of Jerusalem that fall off the wall, there's a law of me'ila, that's what Rabbi Meir says. So same issue. What do you mean? The walls, right? How could there be me'ila? Don't people benefit from the stones in the wall? Lo temo Rabbi Meir, ala emo Rabbi Yehuda. Why don't we say Rabbi Yehuda? And then that resolves it. Now, so now we have that Rabbi Yehuda thinks that the walls of Jerusalem have sanctity to them. Okay, and there's laws of Me'ila apply to them. Well, but wait, that doesn't fit with something Rabbi Yehuda says somewhere else, because Jerusalem is not sanctified, and the walls of Jerusalem are not sanctified. How do we know this? This is a Mishnah we learned in Nidarim. It says in the Mishnah, something called Hatpasa, which is, I, if I want to forbid something as a vow, I have to connect it. This food to me will be like something that's forbidden. So, Ki'imra, like the animals that get sacrificed on the on the altar. Kedirim, ke'etzim, ke'ishim, ke'echal, ke'mizbeach, ke'erushalayim. Okay, these are all things that go on the temple, the, the trees, the fire, right, the wood, the fire. 
Okay, then we get to the altar and like Jerusalem. Okay, because Jerusalem is sanctified, right? Meaning like the walls of Jerusalem. So Rabbi Yehuda Omel, but Rabbi Yehuda disagrees and says, Kol Omel Yerushalayim lo amar klum. If you say Jerusalem, it doesn't mean anything. Now notice there's a small difference. The, the first opinion is a Ke Yerushalayim, like Jerusalem. And Rabbi Yehuda says, anyone who says Jerusalem, right? This bread, Jerusalem. If you want to say, that maybe Rabbi Huda's opinion is, well, if you say Jerusalem, it doesn't mean anything. You have to say like Jerusalem, because that's the whole concept of hat pasa, to say this is like this. Well, if you say that, then we have no problem. He does think Jerusalem is sanctified. He just thinks you didn't use the kaf there, the like, which means that's why it's not going to be forbidden. But you can't say that, because Ahatanya, it says in a different bright huh? Rabbi Yehuda Omer Kol Omer Ki Yerushalayim Lo Amar Klum Ad Shidor B'Davar HaKarev B'Yerushalayim. Just saying like Jerusalem, or saying the whole phrase like Jerusalem, won't work either according to Rabbi Yehuda, according to this Brayta, because you have to say it's forbidden like something that is sacrificed in Jerusalem. Just saying Jerusalem doesn't work. Just saying like Jerusalem doesn't work. So how do we? How are we going to now say that this source is Rabbi Yehuda? When, if we want to say that Rabbi Yehuda says the stones that fall out of the wall of Jerusalem are um, there's a law of Meilah, meaning they're sanctified, then that doesn't fit with Rabbi Yehuda, who thinks that Jerusalem isn't sanctified at all. To which they answer, Trey tonight, Ninhu of Ali Rabbi Yehuda. There's two ways to understand Rabbi Yehuda. That bright, we brought two sources. One said Rabbi Yehuda says Yerushalayim doesn't mean anything. One said Ki Yerushalayim. If you hold like Ki Yerushalayim, then you can't reread the source according to Rabbi Yehuda. But if you say Yerushalayim is what he said, and Ki Yerushalayim would actually work, that's because he does think it's sanctified and that fits in together with the stones. So we end up saying there is a way at least to understand this so it doesn't contradict Rabbi Meir. So we brought three sources against Rav's interpretation of Rabbi Meir that anything that is sanctified but has room where someone can benefit, like the walls of Jerusalem, like the clothing of the Kohen Gadol, that's what our, our mission is referring to, specifically those unique cases where once something can be partially used, if you accidentally use it and try to betray the woman with it, it won't work. But if it's not that, and it's just regular me'ila, like any money, let's say, that's sanctified and you betray the woman with it, he doesn't agree with Rabbi Yochanan that it's all a mekach ta'ut and it was all a mistake and really nothing changes here, nothing becomes chulin, that's why you can't use it. No, no, no. Comes Rav and says, no, no, no. Actually, that would become Hulin and you could betroth the woman, even according to Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir was talking about this unique case. Now we're going to go back to that first opinion of Rabbi Yochanan and have a, a, a someone else is going to explain it in the same way as he does, and we're going to get a little more in depth about it. Amar Ula Mishmeta Barpada. So Ula says in the name of Barpada, Omer Haya Rabbi Meir, Hektesh B'mezim Mitchalel, B'shogeg E Mitchalel. So he says, like Rabbi Yochanan had said, that according to Rabbi Meir, Hekdesh on purpose will turn to Chulin, and that's why you can betray the woman with it. But Bishogeg, if you do it accidentally, it doesn't become Chulin. Again, this goes completely against Rav, but like Rabbi Yochanan's understanding. Now we have to understand, what the Torah did seem to indicate that laws of Me'ila apply in a Shkaga case, and therefore you would think it turns to Chulin, because if it doesn't turn to Chulin, then you're, you haven't you haven't made it unsanctified. So what he says is, well, when we say b'shogeg mitchalel, el elinyan korban bilvad. He says this strange thing, which in a minute the Gemara is going to totally reject. But he says that when we say that it's mitchalel and that there's mi'ila and shkaga, what it means is, if you accidentally used, misused, consecrated property, used it for something else, you have to bring a sacrifice, but it remains in its sanctified state. To which the Gemara says, that's absurd. Your whole reason why you're chayv shvua me'ila is because you took something sacred and you used it for a non-sacred purpose. Now, if you didn't turn it into something sacred, a uh, non-sacred, then you haven't done anything wrong. The problem is that you're ruining the sanctity of this item and you're taking it and changing its status. And that's why you're obligated to sacrifice. So you can't possibly say that there's such a thing that it isn't there's no chilul, it doesn't become chol, not sacred. And yet you're obligated to korban, no way, no how. So they fix what Barpada must have said, because this was passed down from Ula in the name of Barpada, 
comes El Kiata Ravim, these are both Amoraim from Eretz Israel who are coming to give over the Torah of Barpada, who was from Israel, who was earlier. El Kiata Ravim, so when Ravim came to Bavel, he explained to us, Parish Mishmei de Barpada, he explained the following in the name of Barpada. Omer Haya Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir was known to say, Hekdesh Bebezi Bitchalel, Bishogeg Emitchalel, the same thing. Hekdesh, intentionally it will become Chulim. Unintentionally, it won't become Chulim. Unless what? Lo amru b'shogeg mitchalel. Now, according to this, Rabbi Meir's understanding of me'ila and shkaga in the Torah and the whole thing that me'ila is only in accidental cases is very limited. The only time you're going to give a korban me'ila is what? Lo amru b'shogeg mitchalel. It will become chulin, and then you'll be obligated your korban, which we just learned has to go hand in hand. Ela le'inyan achila bilfad. The whole issue by us, and this really explains it even better, with the kiddushin, was that you were giving her money. She was supposed to be betrothed by that money. When you find out that the whole thing was chulin, you both, uh, sorry, hekdesh, you both say, I never would have wanted that. I want the money to go back. And in, in the end, you can do that. The money can go back. And it was as if nothing transpired. And that's where Rabbi Meir thinks in that case, the money actually doesn't become chulin because we go by what we talked about before. Mekach ta'ud. It's just a mistake. It was a mistaken sale or a mistaken betrothal, right? We said it applies to sale betrothal just the same. However, if I took, let's say, sacrificial meat and I ate it, okay, I gave it to my dog, let's say, and my dog ate it, okay, that was not treating it in a sanctified manner. If my dog ate that sacrificial meat, that would be me'ila by by accident. Why? If I did it accidentally, why? Then I'd be high of the korban. Because it's consumed. Once something is consumed, you can't say, oh, it all goes back. There's nothing to go back. So then I'm obligated me'ila. Because what I did was, I had that become consumed, which turned it into chulin, which basically means that now I'm obligated because I treated it as chulin and it got consumed. So if something gets consumed, then I will be obligated me'ila. If it's still there and we can just reverse it and say, you know, erase or delete, let's say, right? This never happened because that's not what I would have wanted. Had you told me I never would have wanted this, then it actually goes back to its original state of being hectic. And that's a very interesting distinction that he's making, which helps us understand Rabbi Meir a little bit better, which is how does he understand the ilah according to Torah law? It's only in items that are consumed, okay? I, I drank something, right? Yeng nesach, um, you know, wine that was not yeh nesef of Gentiles, but wine that they used for libations in the temple. And I drank it, right? So I'm liable for me'ila because I took it and I treated it like chol and I turned it into chol by drinking it. In my mouth, it became chol. Amar Av Nachman, Amar Av Adabar Abba. Now we have to go back to the Mishnah. We had these two. We had three machlokot, but we're talking about the last two. Halacha, between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehud about Maaser. Is Maaser mamon gavoa or mamon hediot? Is it money that belongs to God? Sanctif- like hektish? Or is it money that belongs to people? And then we had a machloka. If it's your own money, it's just you have to bring it to the temple and eat it there, then you can betroth a woman with it. If it's not your money, but it belongs to God, then you can't betroth a woman. So, Amrav Nachman, Amrav Adabra Ava, Halacha ke Rabbi Meir b'Maser. Okay, the halacha is like Rabbi Meir. You remember what Rabbi Meir said by Maser, right? He said the opposite of what he said by Hekdesh. He said, Maser Sheni, Bein b'Shogeg, Bein b'Mezid, Lo Kidesh. Okay, she's not betrothed at all with Maser Shani money because Maser Shani money is Mamon Gavot, belongs to God. And Rabbi Yehuda said that Bishogeg Lo Kidesh, but B'Mezid Kidesh, B'Mezid it works because it's his own money. Okay, if it was Bishogeg, then it's a different story. But B'Mezid, it's his own money, so he can. So now he says the following. The halacha is like Rabbi Meir. B'Maser, Maser is considered Mamon Gavot. Like God. Because we have a Stam Mishnah that holds that way. There's generally a rule if there's a Mishnah with an unattributed name and no Machloket. We assume that's the Halacha. And when it comes to laws of Hekdesh and Me'ila, like we discussed, and betrothing a woman with Hekdesh, the Halacha is like Rabbi Yehuda, okay, which is why our whole understanding of Me'ila really goes according to Rabbi Yehuda and not these weird understandings of, you know, we don't even understand how to understand Rabbi Meir, but who has a very limited understanding of Me'ila, possibly. Again, according to Rav, it's not so limited. It's just this case was unique. But according to Rabbi Yochanan and Barpada, it's actually pretty standard. This was, he thought in general, and then you'd have to say, kind of like Barpada, that 
Me'il only applies if it's consumed, but not if it's not consumed. Otherwise, it's a mekach ta'ut, but we don't hold that way. We hold like Rabbi Yehuda Behektesh, the Beshogeg, it becomes chulin. And therefore, you can actually betroth a woman with hektesh money. Ho'il, and what's the reason why we hold like Rabbi Yehuda here? Ho'il v'stam lantana kavate, because this is stam mishnah like this. So now we have to find out, number one, where is the Stam La Mishnah that holds like Rabbi Meir by Maaser, and where is the Stam Mishnah that holds like Rabbi Yehuda by Hektish? And then after that, we're going to have several questions. Oh, what about this Mishnah? What about that Mishnah? That seems to go against what we said. So, Ki Rabbi Meir by Maaser Mahi. What's the Mishnah by Rabbi Meir in Maaser? Ditna. Okay, the Mishnah says, we're in a Mishnah in Maaser Sheni. Kerem Revai. Kerem Revai is your, your Kerem, or some people say it's even Neta Revai, whether it's your trees or your, um, your vines, your grapes, that grow for the first three years, it's Orla. The f- we can't eat them at all. The fourth year, you have to bring it to the temple, very much like Maser Sheni. You, you could redeem it on a coin and bring the money to Jerusalem and eat it there. Kerem Revai. Beit Shemai Umbrim, Ein Lo Chomesh Ve'ein Lo Bio. It's not completely like Maser Sheni because you don't have to add the Chomesh. You don't have to add the extra fifth when you redeem it because the Torah only says the fifth by Maser. And there's no law of Bior Maschot. Bior Maschot is at the end of the fourth and the seventh year. You have to say, Bi'arti HaKodesh Menabayit. Say, I got rid of all my Maser. You have to get rid of them all, etc. Beit Hillel Omrim, Yeshlo. Beit Hillel says it has all the same rules as Maser Sheni. Another machloka between them, Beit Shammai Omrim about Kerem Rabai, Yesh lo peret ve yesh lo olalot. If you drop some of them, okay, that's like leket by food, so by fruits and vegetables, when it comes to, uh, or by fruits, when it comes to peret the grapes, it's leaving over dropping a few of the grapes, it's called peret, or olalot is if there's clusters, where you have a cluster of grapes that's missing a whole huge chunk in the middle of it or something like that, you have to leave that for the poor also, like a messed up uh, bunch of grapes. Ubet hilalombrim kulo lagat. No, you can take all of this and take it to the God. Okay, there's no issue here of parrot all alone. Okay, it's you can take it and make wine out of it. So now we want to understand. My time of debate, hello, the first machlok. Gamre kodesh kodesh mi maser. Says this Xera Shava. It says kodesh by maser. It says kodesh by karim revai. Ma maser yesh lo chomesh ve yesh lo biur. Av karim revai yesh lo chomesh ve yesh lo biur. Therefore, even though the, the halachot of biur and the fifth, only come up in Maser Shani. Whatever's true for that is going to be true for Karim Revai. Ubeit Shammai lo gamre kodesh kodesh mi Maser. And Beit Shammai says we don't make that Xerah Shava at all, and therefore not. Ubeit Hillel lo brim kimasil. When Beit Hillel says it's like Maser, kiman sviralu. Who could he be holding like? Ike Rabbi Yehuda. Now, if he holds it's like Maser, well, what did we say about Maser? According to Rabbi Yehuda, it's mamon hediot. According to um, Rabbi Meir, it's Mamon Gavoa, it belongs to God. So now, if he says Karim Revai is like Maser, that would mean it's, let's say it's Rabbi Yehuda, it belongs to that, it's owned by that person, right? Kiman Sviralu, Ike Rabbi Yehuda, if he holds like Rabbi Yehuda, that it's Mamon Hediot, Amai Kulo Lagat, Ha'amar Maser Mamon Hediotu, El Alav Ki Rabbi Meir. How could you say that it all go now, what does it mean Kulo Lagat? You don't have a law of parrot and you don't have a law of olalot. Why not? Anything that belongs to me, I have to give part of it to the poor. That's why Beit Shammai says, yesh lo peret, yesh lo olalot, it belongs to me. But Rabbi Yehuda says you can use it all for the God. Why? Because, well, right, you'd have to say you can use it. It's, it's still got sanctity to it. It's, it's, it's still got the status of Karim Rabbi. But we view it as belonging to God. Once something belongs to God, there's no laws of parrot and olalut. It doesn't apply. It only applies between humans, one person to another. It doesn't apply between God. So anything, for example, if it's owned by the temple, there's no law of parrot and olalut. So Rabbi Yehudu says, Kulo lagat, basically is saying that, I'm sorry, Beit Hillel, my mistake. Beit Hillel says, Kulo lagat, must be holding like Rabbi Meir who says that it's Mamon Gavoa, belongs to God, and that's why there isn't any. So here you see, now it's not actually a Stam Mishnah, it's a little bit tricky. It's Beit Hillel, though. We all know we hold like Beit Hillel. So the Beit Hillel is the main opinion here, and therefore you see it follows the opinion of Rabbi Meir and not the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda there. So now we move to the second one. Ki Rabbi Yehuda behektesh mahi. How do we know we hold like Rabbi Yehuda when it comes to hektesh? That again, Beshkaga is mitchalel, right? And... 
um, we'll see, okay? And therefore, if you want to do Kiddushin with money that was used for, in a, in a miss, right, in the wrong way, you can actually be betrothed, okay? So let's see what it says here. Ditna. And then that basically means, uh, and the other thing that's very important is, he says if it was Mezid though, right, what does he say, Bemezid? Bemezid lo kidesh. If you do Me'ila intentionally, we weren't focusing on this at all for now, but now we're going to go back to this. If you do it intentionally, then that's not Me'ila at all. Okay, that seems to be from the simple reading of the of the Torah. It's all Bishkaga. Okay, if you do Me'ila Bishkaga, it says there in the Pasuk, by accident. The, so, if you do it b'mezid, it's not mitchalel, which means, right, it doesn't become chulin, which means there's no be'ila yet, which means that you can't betroth a woman with it. So let's see what we have Mishnah like this. Titna, okay, here's a Mishnah in me'ila. Shilach b'yad pikach. Okay, we're going to have four people here, okay? We'll start with uh, Ruvain. Sends with Shimon, okay? He sends with Shimon something, okay, something that was sanctified. He's... Ruven is the works in the temple. He sends Shimon with money from the temple or an item from the temple to take to a store to sell. Now they forgot that it was Hekdesh, but they remembered both Ruven and Shimon remembered before Shimon gets to the store that it was sanctified. And But he gives it to the Chemvani anyway. So now, if you hold Mezid, it's Mithalel, then it should already go to Chulin. And then the Chemvani, when he goes and uses it and passes it on, so Shimon goes to the store, gives it to Levi, and right buys something from Levi, gives him this money, let's say it's money from the temple treasury, and then Levi set, you know, gives change back to Yehuda when he comes into his store. Okay, that's the scenario. So if Reuven sent Shimon to do his errand, Shimon and Reuven both remember before the money gets to Levi, Levi, the storekeeper, gives the change to Yehuda. What happens? As soon as he gives the money to Yehuda, he's liable for Me'ila. Now, what makes it clear here? That if you do a B'mezid, it wasn't Mitchalel Adayin. You didn't turn it to Chulin because the Chembani was the one who did it. Levi was the one who messed up the whole thing. Okay, that's our, that's how we prove Halacha like Rabbi Yehuda in Hekdesh and Halacha like Rabbi Meir in Maser. Now they're going to go back to the Maser issue. And they say the following. Um, Wait, is it so clear we hold like Rabbi Meir when it comes to Maser and we don't have a Mishnah that holds that the whole theory was Stam Mishnah like Rabbi Meir. So we're going to hold like Rabbi Meir because we found a Mishnah that follows his opinion. But now we're going to say, we also have a Mishnah that follows Rabbi Yehuda. Okay, and then we're going to have Stam Mishnah this and Stam Mishnah that. Why is one going to win out over the other? Vahatnan doesn't it say in a Mishnah. Hapodeh, now we're in a Mishnah in Maaser Shini. Hapodeh Maaser Shini Shalom, Mosif Alav Chamishato, Be Mishalom, Be Mishani Tano, Be Matana. If you redeem your Maaser Shini, you have to add a Chomash, whether it was your own or whether it was given to you as a gift. Okay, if I redeem someone else's Maaser Shini, I don't have to take an extra, I don't have to add the extra fifth. But if it was given to me as a gift and now owned by me, then I have to. Now, what does this show? Mane Ilema. Rabbi Meir, uh, Ilema Rabbi Meir, he, if this is Rabbi Meir who said that Maser Sheni belongs to God, well, mi yavle matana. how could I possibly have, how could there be a reality, a situation where I have money, uh, why I have Maser Sheni produce that was given to me as a gift? You can't give it to me as a gift if it belongs to God. He says it belongs to God. So it must be Rabbi Yehuda. To which they answered, no, not necessarily. Well, you could have given me this gift in two ways. You gave it to me either once it was Master Shani money. Okay, that won't work according to Rabbi Meir because it's Mamon Gavoa. But if you gave it to me before I took before you took the Master from it, you gave me the all the fruits from your tree, you know, or a pile of fruits from your tree that you didn't take Master from. That's called Tevel. Okay? So now, you gave it to me when it was Tevel. That's not a problem. Well, it depends what you hold. But he must hold that if you give me a pile of tevel, which means untithed produce, it, we don't view it as the whole is the sum of its future parts, which means in the future it'll be truma, 
and maaser and regular, right? It'll be a mix of all those things. And then it's as if you're giving me, and then we look at it as if it's sanctified and then you're giving me sanctified items, which you can't give me a gift if you don't own it. But we don't view it that way. We view the whole as what it is right now, not as the sum of its future parts, what it will be in the future. So that's what we're going to say now. He must hold, those this Mishnah must hold, Matanot Shalohuru, if you haven't yet taken the Masro, the gifts yet, Kemisha Lohuru Damian. It's as if it's not called Truma. It's not called Maser. It's not called anything. And then you could actually read the source according to Rabbi Meir and say, basically, even if it's Mamon Gava, someone could have given you the gift before it actually had the name of Maser on it. Tashma, second source, which is very similar, but a little different because you can't answer in the same way. And you'll see why in a minute. Same thing we're going to do for Neta Revai. Neta Revai, again, we talked about this before, things that grow on the fourth year from the trees. And you know, this has no tevel form. It's immediately from when it grows, it is already sanctified. It's got that level to it. So now if you're going to say it's the same, and Rav Meir says that's Master Shemi's Mamon Gavoa, the Neta Revai is also Mamon Gavoa. And what does it say here? We're going to have the same problem, which it says it's given as a gift. Given as a gift would have to be once it's already sanctified, and then it can't be Rabbi Meir. So ha podet neta revai shalom mosif alav chamishato be mishalom be mishinitan lo be matana. So again, if you have neta revai and you want to redeem it, you have to add a fifth, whether it's yours or whether you got it as a gift. Ilem mani, who is this according to Ilem or Rabbi Meir? Me matayavle. If it's Rabbi Meir, which is what we were hoping, right? Because we just said we're going to pass them like Rabbi Meir because Stam La Mishnah like Rabbi Meir, but now we're going to have a Stam Mishnah which doesn't match Rabbi Meir. So Mimasayava, you can't give him as a gift. Hagamri Kodesh Kodesh Mimasir. We have this Sarah Sheva Mas Kodesh Kodesh. It's just like Masir, which means if Masir is belongs to God, then Neta Ravai belongs to God. El Alav Rabbi Yehuda it must be Rabbi Yehuda. And again, you can't say it's before because there is no before. Well, maybe there is, and that's what we're going to say right now. Ah, it must be you gave it to him before it budded or when it was just a bud. And when it's just a bud, to loke Rabbi Yossi, and here you have to say, and it holds like a different opinion also, a particular opinion. And it's not like Rabbi Yossi who holds that the smadar is already forbidden because the bud is the beginning of the fruit. But this must hold, no, 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 the bud is not the beginning of a fruit. And if you got it as a gift when it was still a bud, well, then it's not even called Neta Revai yet, and it could still be your own, and then you could give it as a gift to someone. And that's why you could theoretically, or someone could theoretically, have a gift that you gave them that was from this bud. Okay? And even if you hold like Rabbi Meir. So this Mishnah doesn't go against Rabbi Meir. Now we're going to have another one, though. Tashma, mashachimenu maaser b'sela. If, let's go back to our laws of kinyanim. If something is hektish, the kinyan is done by giving the money. If something is not hektish, then the kinyan is done by meshicha, pulling. So in this case, we have someone who takes maaser, the sela. I bought your maaser, okay, or I don't, let's take a name. Yael bought maaser from Tamal. When Yael buys the maaser from Tamal, it's worth a sela. But she doesn't pay her the money yet, she just pulls it. Okay, now, again, this will be a kinyan if... Right now, what's going to happen when the price fluctuates? The question is, did we get locked in at the price of Mashiach because Mashiach was Kone because it's Mamon Hedyot, regular person money, or if it's Mamon Gava, then the Mashiach didn't do anything and we're going to have to go by the price of when I actually go to pay. So let's see what happened here. Lo speak liftoto ad shama b'shtayim. By the time Yael actually went to pay to the money, well, the price had gone up to two, doubled in price. No ten sela. Yael only has to give Tamar the sela. I hope I'm not getting the words names confused. Who's buying from who? I'm sorry. But Yael is buying it from Tamar, redeeming it or buying her fruits, her produce. So she says, ah, right, I'm buying her maser. Yael is buying Tamar's maser. She says, here's a sela and Mr. Kare Basela. And she wins out because now she has produce that's worth double the value. And that's because Meshicha is Kone. When is Meshicha Kone? When is Mamon Hedyo? So this seems to go like Rabbi Yehuda against Rabbi Meir, right? Umasir Sheni Shelo. And then basically the Masir Sheni becomes hers. So Mani, who is this according to? We already know. Rabbi Meir, Ilema Rabbi Meir, if you're going to say that, am I Mr. Kerbisela? Right? If it's Mamon Gavah, we say, how do you redeem it when you give the money? 
Remember, this is this Pusik, that's not really a Pusik, but they always quote it. It says, Kesef in the Pusik, and it says, Bekamlo, money is what establishes the Kenyan, and that didn't happen until the end. She should have paid the higher price. El Alav, Rabbi Yehuda. It must have been Rabbi Yehuda. But then they say, if so, it's Rabbi Yehuda. Lo Alam, Rabbi Yehuda. This really can only work according to Rabbi Yehuda. Well, even if it's Rabbi Yehuda, we still can explain why we hold like Rabbi Meir. Because we have one Stam Mishnah like Rabbi Meir and one Stam Mishnah like Rabbi Yehuda, but they say this Mishnah that goes like Rabbi Meir is one Mishnah. The one like, I'm sorry, like Rabbi Yehuda that we just read. But the one we saw before like Rabbi Meir, and we saw earlier in the beginning, you know, on the earlier on this side of the daf, was actually found not only where we found it, but it also appears in um, in Eduyot. Okay? It appears in two places. So that's why two against one, and that's why we hold like Rabbi Meir. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute, Istamadafka, if the whole theory here is when you have a Stam Mishnah, it goes like, right, we're going to Pascha that way. Mali Chad Stam and Mali Trey Stam. What's the, what, what, what's the difference? If if once you say this this theory, a Stam Mishnah means we hold that way, but in this case we have two different Stam Mishnahs. Now one might happen to be written twice, but it it ruins the whole thing here about there being a Stam Mishnah because we have two different Mishnayot that say two different things. So what's the difference if there's three and two say this and one says that? It's not a numbers game. It's that Stam Mishnah teaches us something. In this case, clearly Stam Mishnah doesn't teach us anything because there's two different Stam Mishnahs that contradict each other. To which they answer, right? So Istam Adafka Mali Chad Stam Mali Trey Stam. If you're going to say Stam is the whole thing is all about Stam teaches you Alacha, what's the difference if it's one or two? To which I'm Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Halacha Karabi Meir Ho Il Utnam BeBechir Ta Kavate. Ah, this Mishnah appear both in Master Shani and in Eduyo, but Eduyo it's not a matter of two against one versus the other Mishnah that seemed to go right. The other Mishnah in um, actually that Mishnah. One second. I assume it's also in Master Shani. Let me just check. Not that it matters, but yeah, also in Master Shani. So we have two Mishnayot in Master Shani that each say different things. But the one like Rabbi Meir appears in Edu Yod. And Edu Yod is considered Tanam Bebechirta. It's considered the special Masechet because it's all these testimonies of rabbis about Halachot. And therefore, we Paskin like that one. So it's a matter of quality versus quantity. Okay, and that's the end of our daf. So what we did today, quick review, we started with a second understanding of how to understand Rabbi Meir and the Mishnah, and one that really seems to go more with the way we always understood Me'ila, that really Bishkaga, it is Mitchalel, it does become Chulin, and you'd have to understand the Mishnah in a very unique case about something like the walls or the, the, the sanctified her with something that had some sort of use outside of sanctified area, like the Konim, uh, the regular Konim's clothes, and that was a unique case, but really the rule would be otherwise. Then we brought a better, you know, a more in-depth explanation of Rabbi Yochanan's approach in the name of Barpada about how to understand Rabbi Meir according to the original way, which is that Hekdesh and, and Me'ila in Hekdesh is really only in food, things that got consumed, or it doesn't have to be food, it could be something that was burned, it could be something. Only if you consumed the item would you actually be liable for Me'ila. If it's something that can go back, like a mekach ta'ud, and just say, oh, had I realized I never would have done this, then it just reverts back and it actually doesn't lose its sanctity, in which case you're not liable for me'ila, in which case the main point, you can't betroth the woman with that. Then we paskind, how do we hold like Rabbi Meir on the mamon? We paskind like Rabbi Meir, that, that Master Sheni is mamon gavoa, belongs to God. We paskind like Rabbi Yehuda about the hektesh, that really me'ila does turn every hektesh into chudin, and if it's accidental, not if it's intentional, but if it's accidental. And then we try, we said, why? Because Stam Mishnah like each one, which is the Stam Mishnah? And then we tried to say, seems like this other Stam Mishnah is the contradict. In the end, we did find one that contradicted in the mass sale. And we said, oh, but that shouldn't bother us because ours appears in Eduyo. And that's a stronger one. And therefore, we must pass in that way. With that, we'll finish our daf. Wishing everybody a Moadim Simcha Chag Sameach.